So I'm really excited to announce the next panel. As Anita had mentioned earlier today, we haven't seen too much about pet food when it comes to cultured meat. And now that the, uh, now that the industry is starting to really ramp up, we're starting to see more and more. Um, and so we have a really exciting panel here with, with I, and I want to say all of the, the pet food players in the space when it comes to, to cultured meat and pet food. Uh, and so um, I will pass the mic off um, so they can go ahead with the formal introductions, uh, and uh, and we can go from there. Th thank you, guys. All right. Hello. All right. Excellent. Really, it's quite a pleasure to be here. Alex, thank you. And I want to thank the rest of the Cultured uh, Meat Symposium folks as well for having inviting us here. This is... Pretty exciting that, like, like Alex was saying, this is probably one of the first. I think this is groundbreaking in the sense we're making history. This is the first time that any official cultured meat or cultured protein conference has had anything to do with pet food. So we're going to talk about cultured meat. We are going to talk about alternative proteins. We're going to talk about cultured proteins, fermented proteins, but specifically we're going to talk about those in regard to companion animal foods. So. I know it's opportunities in pet food. I don't particularly like the word pets, but I didn't ask Alex, Alex to change it because it might get kind of confusing when you talk about animals and animal free, so it was like pet food. So we'll just go with that. But, but we're gonna be talking about mainly specifically about the opportunities for the future of food with dogs and cats. And um, you know, we are, you know, there's a possibility today that we may say a few things that offend some people. <laughs> just us being up here might be offensive. There has, been, <laughs> for some reason, there's just been this silence on talking about the opportunities in this space w when it comes to dogs and cats. So um, I just want you to understand deliberately if we are provocative or saying anything, people just get offended naturally about this topic. So, um, But I may say a couple of things about uh, negatively about the meat industry, the animal use of that. So warning you ahead of time, I may offend some people in that area too. But again, not deliberately, it's just part of the thing. So before we get going, I just want to ask how many people here are um, pet parents to a dog or a cat or have a dog or a cat in their life that's a companion animal? Raise your hands. OK, so about half the room. So half the room really knows how much food, <laughs> how much meat, and how many animal products dogs and cats eat. It's, it's pretty incredible. And that's what we're going to talk about today is like people just don't realize that dogs and cats eat a lot of animal products. But the truth is, get this out of the way as well, dogs are omnivores like us. They can eat plants. They can actually thrive on a plant-based diet. Cats, however, are Carnivores, obligate carnivores, it's a scientific term. You'll keep hearing it. We hear it over and over. Cats are obligate carnivores. They have to meet. It's true. And I will tell you something else about it, because I have a dog and a cat, both rescues. My cat, he's 14 years old. I'm going to tell you something about, not only is he an obligate carnivore, he is a stubborn carnivore. Cranky, too. Goes with the territory of cats. And conservative. So that's another thing I will tell you. Cats are conservative. Dogs, plant-based, can be. But like other liberals, dogs are liberals, but they will eat meat as well. So that is kind of the truth about dogs and cats. Dogs are liberals for sure, and cats are conservatives. But the other thing you don't, might not realize is those animals in our homes eat so much meat, so many animal products. So to put it in perspective, if you took all these lovely dogs and cats um, out there are more, by the way, there are more dogs than children in San Francisco. As a matter of fact, if you look at all the big cities, there's more dogs and cats than children in those big cities. And if you keep doing the research like I did, there's more dogs and cats in the United States than there are children. And they're eating a lot of animals. So one, <laughs> one way of getting your head wrapped around how many animals uh, we feed our dogs and cats so you can understand what the opportunities are and what, why we need to start talking about this if you took all the dogs and cats living in the United States right now and you took them out of their homes, now I'm not, don't wanna, there's already enough unwanted homeless animals, so I'm not, don't, this is hypothetical. 
took all the dogs and cats out of their homes in the United States and you put them, let's say, in France. And you took all the French people, all the human French citizens, and you took them and you put them in all the homes in the United States. It would be interesting, right? You'd get a lot of, <laughs> get a lot of mischief, maybe extramarital affairs. But on the good side, you'd have Americans would start learning more about culture, history, wine, right, <laughs> art. But on the downside, we would lose our communication. Like, we communicate really well with our dogs and cats, not so much with French people. I don't know if you've ever been to France, but honestly, I grew up, I spent, I've been there many times, so I'm not, again, I might offend some people, so I'm sorry. But the communication's much better with dogs and cats than it is with French people. So, but the truth is about that switch, one thing would stay the same if you switched every same amount of meat eaten. And the French eat a lot of meat. They eat as much as the fifth largest country in the world of meat consumption, that's France. So the dogs and cats living in our homes are eating as much meat as French human beings. So the United States, humans eat the most meat. Next would be China, I think, and then India, and then Brazil, and then, yes, France. That's a lot of cows, pigs, chickens, fish, horse, and rabbits. So you can see what the opportunities are here. There are a lot of animals being eaten by our pets. Now, so we're gonna talk about this in a really interesting way, I think, that might be kind of exciting for everyone. We're gonna answer these questions, we're gonna look at it for a big picture. So the big picture is, we are gonna ask three questions, the whys and the hows and the whats of this industry. And we, have, we are so lucky to have three pioneers, and I'll just say that lightly, these really are the three pioneers we have Rich Hellman from Bond Pets. We have Abriel Estrada from Wild Earth. And we have Joshua Arrow from Because Animals. Three companies that I've known since the beginning of this. When I started thinking about this, I met all these people. So we're going to start. We're going to we're going to start with letting them just tell you a little bit about what 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 who they are and what their company does. Joshua, go. Yeah, I'll start on this end. Hi, I'm Joshua. So Because Animals uh, started, obviously, from our name, uh, from a love of animals. We decided to make, uh, we had a bit of a journey to get where we are today, but right now we're focused on cultured meat, pet food, uh, and our first product is going to be a cultured mouse treat for cats, uh, mouse being the native diet of the cat. Hi, everybody. I'm Abril, or if you can't roll your R's, Abril, that's how everybody calls me. Um, I'm Chief Product Officer at Wild Earth, and we're a Berkeley-based biotech company. So we do consider ourselves, first and foremost, a biotechnology company um, that is working on delivering cleaner, better, healthier foods for pets. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I'm Rich. <clears throat> I'm with Bond Pet Foods out of Boulder, and we're working with biotechnology. I think we are <laughs> um, to, to make pet food from more conventional proteins like chicken, turkey, and fish without the animal. And basically, our approach to getting there is working with age-old fermentation techniques that are used in cheese manufacture to make enzymes for cheese, or good bacteria for probiotics, or even the heme protein in the Impossible Burger. We're just reassembling that process to more efficiently and responsibly harvest high quality meat proteins and then using that as the foundation of our complete recipes. So that's, that's our long game. So uh, I am Philip and I am extremely lucky because I spent uh, many years in the music business and then I had this opportunity here to um, work with this incredible company, Earth Animal. They are a well-established pet food company. They've been around since 1979 making holistic, healthy products and the founders are incredible. They care so much about animals. They started the company to heal their dog and then it, one thing led to another. So their goal is to heal animals and one thing about them is they have created this incredible alternative rawhide called no hide and it's made from brown rice. Now there are animal products in it and it's sort of bittersweet because it's one of the top selling pet treats in the United States and probably uh, just about to be in Europe, but they want to get rid of the animal products. 
Their CEO is vegan, and he is committed to having me help them replace their products with animal-free, slaughter-free um, proteins and uh, cultured meat. So. so like I said, we're going to start with why, because it's a cliche that you start with why. People don't really care what you do. They care why you do it. So let's find out why. Rich, why are you here? So why am I here? Why am I doing this? Uh, <laughs> you know, so my background may be different than some of the other folks up here, but uh, has nothing to do with food technology and biotechnology. My background's in advertising. I spent the last 25 years working on everything from diapers to motorcycles uh, for P&G, Kellogg's, Facebook, Chevrolet. But an account that I had on Burger King um, was an assignment to help them. This was years ago. This is where before Impossible ever came onto the equation. Uh, it was an assignment to help them compete against Chipotle and Panera, who were literally eating their lunch, um, and to figure out how they can reimagine the future, uh, their specifications of their burger and their future menu. And that whole exercise for me just opened my eyes to the challenges of conventional agriculture. And long story short, I became a vegan working on Burger King, which I tried to hide <laughs> as much as I could. Um, and that sensibility stuck with me so that when my wife and I got our first dog together a few years later, um, I just wrestled with that tension of having to feed our dog and, more importantly, our cat's meat and asking the question, could there be a better way? And uh, at that time, companies like Memphis Meats and Perfect Day and Claire were starting to bubble up, and I was fascinated by it. And uh, the journey just took me in this path of starting up Bond, finding my biotech team and veterinary nutrition team, and the rest is history. We're still at the uh, beginnings of our journey, but at an exciting part of it. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's who we are, what we're doing, or my background, how I got into it, rather. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> So the why for me goes all the way back. Um, I grew up in Mexico, and I grew up in border town of Juarez. And so for me, I was there. I mean, I grew up there when NAFTA really came into play. And so I've always been a nature lover. I love the outdoors, um, you know, environmentalist. But when I was growing up and a kid, I really saw the effects of industrialization and globalization. And so that had a huge impact for me. And so. That just led me to science. Um, I'm a chemist by background. Um, I have a PhD in biomaterial science. And so I really saw technology and science as a way to fix what's wrong with the world. And that led me to food. Because if you really want to make an impact, then you have to touch something that people use or consume every day. And that that's really food. like that. It doesn't get any bigger than that. And so for me, food was just a way to make things better. And then I met my co-founder, Ryan Bethencourt, and he told me about pet food. And I was like, oh, well, tell me more about pet food. Um, and then I just started learning how big of an impact pet food really has on the way that we grow our food, the way that we, um, I guess, use resources, and how much it affects our environment. And so for me, that was just a no-brainer. It's like, I want to use my skills. I want to use my knowledge and background to create better products for pets that will ultimately have a huge impact on in the way that everybody lives their lives, right? How we live our lives, how healthy we live our lives, our pets, and all animals on the planet as well. And um, my journey fittingly started with a cat's meow. I was cutting through an alleyway and I heard this little like teeny tiny meow and my wife and I and we looked over this into this kind of derelict backyard and there was a colony of feral cats and we were like what what is what do we do do they have an owner what are they eating what are they doing uh, that one's like the size of my thumb like we should do something so we we ended up rescuing all of them and the, and the older ones had never seen the inside of a house so we got uh, you know, they're, they were like wild animals, essentially. Um, so we got into cat rescue, and uh, my co-founder, Shannon, uh, is also was also in cat rescue at the time, which is how we connected. And you start thinking about cats, uh, feral cats especially. What do they eat? Uh, they, a lot of times they're not fed. So what do they eat? And it gets you, you start to, the wheels start turning. It's like, 
they're not being fed kibble. They've never seen a piece of kibble. They, they don't know, like, I rescued one cat that was eating, sh like, Chef Boyardee. Some old Italian man was, like, giving the cat noodles, and it, it survived. Uh, I don't know how. And you, you start to look at, like, what's in cat food, and what is cat food? And you start to look at the ingredients, and you see things like taurine is in there. And then if you know a little bit about the, the science of, of, of that, you wonder why they have to put taurine into meat because taurines are supposed to be in meat already. And you, you start to come to the realization pet food is an entirely commercial entity. Uh, it's, not, it's not a nutritional, I mean, it's not formulated around the nutritional needs of, of animals. It's rather, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a product of, our, of commerce and uh, our food system as it stands today. So that makes you, de once you de deconstruct how pets eat, and then you start to think of new ways how pets eat. Uh, we originally, because animals, we originally started thinking about how to uh, replace the protein in, pet, in cat food with, with algae. So that was our original conceit, and eventually we, we switched gears. But um, the whole idea is that uh, cats need, cats and dogs need nutrients, not necessarily ingredients. Um, so not really meat, but what's some of the things that are in meat. So yeah, you, you, start to, you start to think about all this stuff and your brain gets filled with ideas about how to feed your, your family members uh, um, and, and you stumble upon a cultured meat, which led me to Philip. Yes. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we met um, through the Good Food Institute. That's how I met uh, Rich as well. So why I'm here is uh, 30 years ago, I went vegan. <laughs> and so I'm going to break a taboo. I'm going to talk about the fact that, um, that I'm here for animal purposes, to, to make the lives better for dogs and cats. But really, I'm going to read a quote from one of my favorite authors, Yuval Noah Harari. Animals are the main victims of history, and the treatment of domesticated animals in industrial farms is perhaps the worst crime in history. The march of human progress is strewn with dead animals. So when I went vegan, I never thought I'd see the day where there would be this light at the end of the tunnel. It's always been darkness, trying to figure out how we're going to stop consuming so many animals, creating so much suffering on the planet. So why I'm here is because I, was, uh, I had the opportunity to meet this guy, Sam Harris, and I had started having these conversations with Sam Harris about you know, his end of faith. I don't know if you know who Sam Harris is, but he's this kind of prominent um, atheist. But I started having said the same arguments that you make against believing in, in that people believe in this, you know, this God that doesn't exist. Same thing about animals. You don't have to eat meat to live. And so we had these debates. And then all of a sudden, he admitted that he had no moral justification for eating animals, but he did it for health reasons. I said, well, I'm alive. I'm still here. You saw me a couple months later. I'm still alive. I'm still here. No animals. Then he had Uma Valetti on his podcast, and that kind of changed my life. So I came up to the Bay Area. I started meeting all these people. I started working with the Good Food Institute in their entrepreneurial um, endeavors. And I was with my friend Ari and uh, someone I met at an animal event. He's an animal rights activist, very well known. And he goes, hey, we're going to go to this meditation thing. I meditate with Ari. And he goes, hey, do you mind if my friend Uma joins us? So I thought, you know, Ari knows everybody. It's probably Uma Thurman, you know. So her, you know. But it turns out to be Uma Folletti. So I'm sitting there meditating with Uma, and I had a chance to meet Uma. And here I am in the music business for 30 years, and here's this real rock star in front of me, Uma Valetti. So that's how I kind of got in this. I saw with cultured animal products, cultured meat, this light at the end of the tunnel. And when I was talking to the Good Food Institute, it's like Bruce Friedrich said, Philip, you should do something that no one else is doing. Because I was trying to figure out what am I going to do. And every time I opened up that can of cat food, every time I gave that cat food to my cat, I knew there was something wrong with that. So this was the opportunity to create this cultured meat that we can start feeding to, to our domesticated animals, dogs and cats, without have, having to use tortured you know, farm animals that have been confined. So I saw this light of the tunnel and I realized this is an opportunity to leave the music business, move to San Francisco, and get involved with this, this uh, bright future. So there, that, that's my why. So another why is why are dog food and cat food 
such an important uh, endeavor, like, you know, in, in the sense of, in the big scheme of things in the world, why? Why is it important to create this cultured meat for, for dogs and cats? Go. So dog food and cat food are, are uh, in our minds, not really, not really present. We're thinking of restaurants. We're thinking of grocery stores. We're thinking of the food system in that way. But meanwhile, there's as as you kicked off the 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 panel, there's you know hundreds of pounds of meat coming into pet owners' house uh, on an annual basis just through pet food. So what happens when you remove the, all that meat, or if you can remove if if us three can can make breakthroughs and become mainstream, well, you can remake a, you can remake the entire economy, the entire food system, because the the factory farming system thrives uh, by by getting rid of a lot of the the byproduct or the offcuts of of animals, and that comes out as is really what it is biological waste. But instead of paying to have it destroyed, they sell it off to the pet food industry. A lot of it ends, a vast majority ends up in, in animal food. So if you take that out, and that's a huge profit arm for factory farms, the factory farming industry as a whole. You take out that profit arm, you take out that, that peg of the stool, and everything has to get more sustainable. And prices rise, and you know uh, uh, things change. There's a ripple effect that can affect every single, uh, literally, like large swaths of the economy will be affected simply by pet food alone. So that's what, what really, uh, the, that's the impact we're talking about. Um, and it could be on a global scale, even though we're all US based right now. That's my answer anyway. So we've touched, all, in, everybody's touched uh, a little bit on the, the why, why pet food, right? Yeah. Part of it is there's so many pets in the world and it's growing. And you know there's less kids than there are pets. And so they do have a huge impact. There's the economic version, right? If you want, if we want to bring down the industrial farming um, complex, then we have to we have to do away with part of their profits. I think also there's a big component of pets make us happy. You know, there, there's studies that show that living with an animal makes you a happier person. And so, if if you are sharing your life, if you have a companion animal living in your home, then you're going to be a happy person. And I'm sure that everybody who has pets, who's guardian or a pet parent, wants the best for their, you know, furry kids or, or whatever, whatever you choose to call them. And so right now, the state of pet food is atrocious. There is really low quality ingredients going into pet food. And so when we think about what's really in there, what are you feeding them, these are members of your family. When you realize what's happening, it's not anything that you want to eat yourself. Why would you want to feed that to your family member? And so that, that's another reason why. Why pet food? Because they're members of our family, and we want to give them the best life that we can, because we are stewards of their care and of their lives. Exactly. Yeah. 100%, like with all this. The other thing for me that um, really got me into the space, even though I wasn't a food scientist or a scientist by trade, was just the basic recognition that for dogs and cats, if you were to go down this route to try to create meat proteins differently, the beautiful thing is you don't need to recapitulate the meat experience for a dog or cat. Right? They don't look at a steak and say, steak. <laughs> or a chicken breast, right? More, it's more about the palatability for them than the uh, construct of what a hamburger or a steak or a chicken breast is. So with that just simple realization, it just means that the meat proteins that we produce doesn't have to have that structural um, construct to be perfect. It needs to be nutritionally comparable or superior, but when it comes to the experience, that's something and, and that comes at cost that we don't necessarily have to solve or have to crack. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it is true. So one of the things is the nutrition of pet food. It's abysmal. I mean, uh, there are more quality meats going into pet food now, which is detrimental to the farmed animals. But what we have the opportunity now 
is to create a very highly nutritious, healthy product with the food technology. We can, we can mimic meat with plants for dogs. We can create a cultured protein for cats to give them all the amino acids they need. And same with the meat. Because nutrition and pet food right now, even the high quality stuff, it's causing massive disease. I mean, one of the things that's so horrible about the pet food is that dogs have now surpassed humans in cancer. So dogs have the number one rate of cancer of any land or any mammal on the planet. Humans are next. But cats also have major diseases from eating terrible, overcooked meat. So with cultured meat, we have the opportunity to design highly nutritious, ethically pure foods that we can feed to our companion animals and the truth is we shouldn't be bringing other animals into the world, domesticated animals. I love my dog. I love my cat. But, you know, we are to, to have these dogs and cats and then feeding them other animals, it's, it, right there, that cycle has to end. So we have the opportunity to change that detrimental cycle. So one of the things, again, I'm going to break another, I might offend someone, but no more breeding. There's absolutely no reason to breed any more dogs. Every dog should be a rescue. Every cat should be a rescue. We need to learn, we need to change the food system, but we also need to realize that we're killing, every time you buy a dog, you're, you're, you're killing a dog in a shelter when millions of dogs are being killed. So we do have dogs living with us, and we live in a bubble in the Bay Area where they're quite happy, but there's a lot of homeless dogs and a lot of animals, especially cats, being killed in the shelter. So we have an opportunity to change everything for all the animals when we create a healthy uh, nutritious, ethically pure uh, pet food. So, um, let's see. We're, we, I think we got to get to the how. We're running out of... Uh, <laughs> we have so many whys, but we, we're running out of time, so I want to make sure we have time for some questions. So, how? Like, how are you doing this? Yeah, I think I, I alluded to it a little bit in the beginning, but we're uh, working with a very similar technology to what uh, Perfect Day is working with, for example, to produce milk proteins or Clara egg protein, using those beautiful bugs to uh, express the identical meat proteins that you'd find in farm and field. And we're starting with chicken, since it's the most consumed meat in the world for people and pets. Um, we actually uh, took a trip to Kansas. One of our board members is in the back. I won't point him out. <laughs> but we all took a, uh, a trip to uh, a farm north of Wichita to get a biopsy from a chicken just so that we could have uh, some material to work with and have a blueprint um, that we can refer to as we're uh, starting to, to build that protein construct. But essentially, that's our technology that we're using. Um, we're at um, the stages where we've demonstrated we can express many of the proteins that we're looking for. And now it's all about uh, process optimization, and then ultimately, in the next few years, uh, scaling it up so that we have a uh, fermented, delicious chicken protein for cats and dogs to include as part of their diet. All right. Yeah. Very exciting. So while the, at Wild Earth, we have kind of a multi-pronged strategy. Um, when we first started back in 2017, we looked at cultured meat. We were really excited about that. We started culturing mouse meat as well. And so um, we saw that that was more of a longer term project for us. Um, you know, that As everybody knows here, the technology is still developing. There are still a lot of challenges from a scale up, from a regulatory perspective, from a consumer acceptance perspective. And so what we wanted to do alongside that was look at something that was present now and was short term and we could deliver and immediately start making an impact. And so when we looked at what was available to us now, we saw that single cell proteins were the key. And so what I mean by single cell proteins is um, fungal proteins. So we focused on fungal proteins. Um, so we're looking at mycelium um, and unicellular yeast. And so for mycelium, we're looking at um, Aspergillus oryza, which we call koji, or has been known in for centuries or millennia as koji in the East. And um, yeast is one of the proteins that we're now exploring and leveraging in our commercial dog food um, for 
protein replacements. And so we've had really great success. This is the short term, so single cell protein, long term culture protein, and then anything that comes in between, we'll, we're definitely exploring, but th those, that's the way that we're executing on and our fermenting goals. Fermenting protein as well. Yeah, so yeah basically we're fermenting proteins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I really like that approach because the problem is obviously here today, so solutions that are way down the road are, are great, but it's good to have people addressing the problems today. Um, we took a similar approach. Uh, our approach is, uh, we call ourselves the cultured pet food company, so we, we do everything we do is culture grown. So we started with our probiotic for dogs and cats, uh, and that comes in the form of a supplement. So you don't have to switch your dog or cat food. You can use probiotics. It's not necessarily addressing any sort of uh, major meat-based product in pet food, uh, but it, it does it does keep the animal products out of the supplements, which there are a lot in, as, as um, you guys probably know. And then we recently came out with our uh, organic dog cookie, certified organic. It's called Nucci's. It's based on Nucci. Does anyone know what Nooch is? One, one vegan in the crowd. <laughs> Every vegan should Possibly know that, vegan. I think. You know what that is, Phil. Yeah, Come on. Nutritional yeast is kind of a cult ingredient. It's a really star ingredient for, um, for the vegan community and others. Uh, it's a protein, complete protein. Uh, it has all 10 essential amino acids for dogs. So it's, our star, it's the star ingredient of our, of our dog cookie. All these cultured products that we'll continue to put out, um, are kind of our, our ramp up to the ultimate product, which is cultured meat. And we really feel that's the ultimate solution for dogs and cats. But uh, I mean, you're, you're actually doing, you're making cultured meat right now, please. We are, yeah, yeah. So uh, in March of this year, we made uh, uh, some cat treats uh, from a, a mouse line. So we created mouse meat in our lab, we blended that in with some more traditional uh, cat treat ingredients. And uh, my cat, Frankie, the one I, the little meow that he, I was talking about at the beginning of this panel, he uh, was game to try it. And he's the first cat who ever, who's ever eaten a, a cultured meat product. So Frankie, a revolutionary. Um, anyhow, yeah, so that, that's our approach as well, is, is kind of get people used to cultured foods and, and cultured ingredients share our science with the world as we develop it. Um, and now we're, we're, uh, we're full steam ahead in our lab. We have uh, four PhDs working on our uh, cultured meat at the moment. Uh, That's exciting. I mean, yeah, yeah I've, I've known about what you're doing for quite a while, and it's incredible that you've been able to do it. And same with Rich. I'm excited about what you're doing. That's, that's kind of what how we're doing a lot of the stuff at, at Earth Animal. We're doing as uh, I'll steal a line from a presentation that's going to happen tomorrow evening, all of the above. <laughs> so a nod to Paul Shapiro. But the truth is that's what we're doing at Earth Animal. We're doing all of the above. We're doing the plant-based, the fungi-based, the fermentation, and we are looking into the, the cultured meat as well. But all of these people up here, I mean, seriously, Wild Earth, my dog absolutely loved Wild Earth. I mean, the fermentation there, I mean, that is, I'm not a kibble fan, but my dog, she eats she eats wild earth a couple days a week. She eats bee dog a couple days a week. I rotate her food, but it is exactly what the future of, of food's going to be for pets. It's this, you, you know, especially in this plant based way of creating and mimicking this meat, but with no animals harmed. So that's just the, the fungi based, the plant based. But all three of these people up here are doing exactly what, the, what needs to happen in the future. So what, we have time for one more how, probably, before we get to the what. So, uh, so many questions, but how do you deal with the, it's unnatural comment or objection? Because that is, we have so many hurdles to overcome, but that's a big one in the pet food industry. Less so, though, I think, in the, in the human food world, right? So when I've traveled to the um, pet food industry conferences, I've had way less pushback. That's kind of one of the reasons I decided to get into this, besides the, the UCLA report that showed the damage, but was very little pushback because, you know, these are people that love animals, and the CEOs of this company, they absolutely hate. Their, part of their job sourcing is horrible. Rich can attest to that. I think when you went to look at 
humanely raised animals. They didn't exist. But how do you deal with the unnatural uh, objections? Uh, well, th th that, that question was what led us to cultured meat as opposed to any other s solution overall. We're, we're trying to do, there, there are two answers, I guess. There's a long and short answer. I'll give the long one first and then the short one, because if I give the short one first, no one will pay attention to the rest of it. So yeah, so the kosher meat is, is nutritionally identical to, to meat. So when people uh, today, they go out and buy pet food, they'll look at the ingredients, possibly see animal byproduct, chicken byproduct, things that aren't not necessarily hydrolyzed soy. The things that they don't naturally see as like natural ingredients necessarily. Um, the better foods, they'll see the, you know, the human grade meats, which is what the market is sort of trending towards. Then, then you start to look at the the, the actual nat natural diet, but you don't get you, again. You're getting a cat who's eating a cow, or uh, you know, a, a chihuahua eating a, a, a lamb or something so like do that. Do you ever point out to the people like <laughs> I have actually? Well, natural. Your chihuahua is actually not natural. Yeah, put a put a <laughs> yeah, put a yeah, cat. Very <laughs> genetically modified. Uh, yeah, introduce a, introduce a cat and a cow, and you'll see how you know what will happen. A cat, exactly. you'll you'll find out like they'll be friends faster than the cat will eat the cow. Anyhow, the the short answer to all that is is consumers want meat. They want meat for their for their dog or cat, and that's going to take it probably a generation to change. So what we're going to do is we're going to give them meat. It, it's going to not come from the typical place that people assume it's coming from. But as, as we talked about many times, people don't. When people think of farms, they think of uh, a, a man in a straw hat with a pitchfork. They don't think of these uh, um, factory farms that that where the ninety nine percent of the meat actually comes from. Ninety nine point nine percent of yeah. the animals. I don't. Yeah. And they call them factory farms because yeah, it's quite unnatural. Saying it's a farm is very generous. It's a factory, and and no one, no one really likes to know about that that part of where meat is sourced. And it's completely unnatural to to process animals in that way. Uh, it's inhumane. Um, so yeah, the 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 ultimate solution is is cultured meat and nutritionally identical, giving consumers what they want, basically. For us, the. I guess the pushback came from people yelling at us on social media and in person even when we were ready to launch our dog food. Um, people saying, dogs are carnivores. They're descendants of wolves. What are you doing? This is animal cruelty. And so there was a huge disconnect, right? It's like animal, you're accusing us of animal cruelty, but you're advocating to feed animals to your dog. And so there was a big disconnect there. Um, and you know what we say is the the proof is in the pudding, or you know in the pet industry it's, it's in the poop. Um, we have we have a extremely nutritious food, and um, the feedback that we've gotten from our customers is is amazing. We you know one of the main concerns was safety: is this safe for my pet? Um, and so the way that we fought back against all of that pushback and all of that hate. Um, was with data. So, so, as a, so the main pushback you had was not like you're creating something that's unnatural in a lab. You, your main pushback was unatural for dogs to eat yeah. fungi or plants and get their protein from it. Yes, yeah. it's unnatural and potentially unsafe. Yeah. And so, you know, as a scientist, I, I can do everything with data, right? If I can show that this is safe, if I can show you that your dog will thrive, that he or she will be healthier on this diet, that you can have a longer living pet by excluding this horrible meat byproduct from his diet or her diet, then, then, you know, then that's all the proof that you need. And so that's what we've set up to do is, you know, collect studies, collect data, um, and do it in a, in a cruelty-free cruelty -free way. So I don't know if people are aware, but a lot of the pet food studies that are currently done are done with animals and kennels. And so we decided that that was part of the industry that we weren't going to get into. And so all of the testing that we've done, we've done, we've done with volunteer dogs. We've pushed against cruelty on every single front that we've been able to think of and imagine. And so, you know, as a scientist, that that's how I show, hey, this is the best way to go. 
Yeah, I think my experience echoes a lot of what's been talked about up here. I think the other thing just that comes to mind for me is we're, um, and we're based in Boulder. It's a pretty progressive food town, but it's pretty pure in their definitions of what's natural and what's not. So uh, I remember a few months ago sitting on a panel with Beyond Meat, GFI, and a company called Myco Technology. And uh, there were people that were really angry. <laughs> they were talking about merging food and tech together and food and science together. So it is more broadly outside of pet food, obviously, a very um, tense and polarizing topic for people who embrace uh, classic definitions of what's natural and what's not and what's right and what's wrong. Um, but I, I have a sense that you know, we're players in this broader movement and as other companies, even on the human food side, do get traction and people are eating foods that are made in part through technology and they're enjoying the experience and they're seeing that it's healthy and it's good, then that will also affect, I think, the embrace of people who would consider um, foods made through alternative processes like we're taking too. Yeah, so the unnatural thing comes up a lot. I've had, <laughs> I've been at, uh, met with pet food professionals that are standing in front of their line of supplements saying that uh, anything grown in a lab is unnatural, yet they're standing in front of supplements that have all gone through the lab. They're standing in front of kibble that's been gone through a lab. They're standing in front of all kinds of food that has been processed over and over. And the truth is, is that we already know that just because something is unnatural doesn't mean it's not, not good. We have the awesome opportunities here, like you know, what's a refrigerator, is that natural? No, fleas are natural, yet we're, we're trying to combat both of those. So the, the unnatural line just blows me away when I, when I get it in the human food world, but in the pet food world, I'm, I'm even more shocked. So the whole idea that's unnatural to feed dogs, plant-based, dogs are not wolves, you know, they are mentally challenged wolves sometimes, but they're, <laughs> they're not wolves. So we get the unnatural thing a lot. But the other how that I wanted to say is that how, is how we're going to do this is, I think, um, working together, all of us working together in this industry, whether it's pet food, whether it's uh, cultured meat for human food. And for, for us, I know that the, uh, the sentiment that all animals matter, not just dogs and cats, but farmed animals as well, if it, that... That sentiment, if it drives our business, I think we're going to succeed. So that's, that's the last how. So yeah, uh, Maybe I just should mention one thing on the business side of yeah. things. Um, aside from our personal motivations of trying to bring these different foods to market, there's also a huge interest in companies like Mars Pet Care and Nestle Purina, not necessarily just because these kinds of offerings could satisfy uh, a need for a specific audience in their portfolio, but also because they look at their future protein pipeline and you know, there are some challenges to try to satiate the demand of the growing population of pets and doing it in an efficient way and in, in a, a way that makes sense from a unit economic standpoint. And they see the promise and potential of the things that companies like we're working on to perhaps uh, be something that could also um, suit their needs. So there is, will always be an ever-growing need for protein. And with our pets, it's no different. And we can be part of that solution to offer something there. OK, so we're trying to, trying to move it along here. So I have so many what's <laughs> to ask you. But um, let's see. Um, I want to save time for Q&A, so I'm going to ask you, um, what are the significant opportunities in, in this space for, for investors, for entrepreneurs, but what are the, just any, what are the significant opportunities, the big ones that come to mind? So uh, the way I look at it from uh, amateur economist, economists' eyes is pet food is at this crossroads, right, where... Um, the, the market's going towards more uh, human grade or premium cuts of meat. Um, the things like uh, Fancy Feast or whatever, I don't mean to call anyone out, but the cheaper grocery store foods, they're based on volume and their volume's going down. 
So if you look at the industry as a whole, it's the macro um, economical uh, bird's eye view. People are spending more money on pet food, but they're buying less volume, so they're buying more premium stuff. So they, they're intentionally or not, they're trying to get away from what we're trying to get away from too, which is uh, cheap cuts of factory farm meat. Uh, it's inhumane and environmentally unstable, unsustainable. And we kind of uh, we that's a whole that's a whole other panel. I mean, yeah. we're at a culture meat symposium. Everyone knows the the ill effects of, of factory farming. But what are uh, specifically the, are the opportunities? I mean, they don't have to be necessarily financial or economic. Just uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the environmental uh, upswing is huge, but. Just, just to, uh, I'll, I'll just finish my thought on the industry. Is like, you, we could go either way. We could go pet food can continue along the human grain, take take meat out of the human supply, and feed our dogs beautiful, beautiful cuts of, of beef and lamb and and what have you, or we could do it another way. And that's I think why uh, us three are here is to try to guide the industry down another another route um, from an from an environmental standpoint. Um, it's like I was talking about ec economically before. It, the environmental upswing is is kind of knows no bounds. Um, Twenty five percent in that UCLA study that you mentioned, they attribute twenty five percent of the environmental uh, detriment of factory farms can be attributed to the food we feed our pets, and it's a compounding problem. Right? Thirty percent of the meat consumed in the United States is by dog and cats, and it, it and it's not just byproduct yeah. anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's super premium. Re I mean, there are pet food companies now that have their own slaughterhouses. So. Yeah. yeah, and it's compounding every every second of every day. It gets worse and worse and worse. So somewhere, somewhere along the line, someone's going to have to do something about it. Um, and it's, you know, the the uh, I appreciate Rich um, the what you talked about with the the pet food is you know it's eighty percent controlled by four uh, major conglomerates. They are interested in what we're doing, but they also have an interest in their their supply chains that are currently existing right now. A uh, huge interest economically, so um, there is going to have to be some changes coming, and uh, we represent that change. And I think the the greater industry is going to see that from a number of number of levels. I I'll pass the mic now. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Um. So I would say that it's it's. I'd be hard pressed to not push on the economic uh, opportunities here because some of the some of the comments that we've heard from investors, for example, have been, "Well, why focus on pet food? Why not do human food? There's a huge opportunity. You have a you know twenty or thirty trillion dollar business, and pet food in the U.S. is a thirty billion dollar business. Why would you focus on something that's a? Why would you focus on the smaller pie? Um, and so for us, the answer is. There is huge growth in pet food industry, um, especially in the U.S., right? We're seeing more pets. People are spending more on their pets. Um, I think millennials are spending about $150 per month um, compared to... They're going into debt. Yeah. Pets, yeah. <laughs> compared to like $90 for the boomers or something, you know? And so people are spending more money. Um, it's a huge opportunity compared to human food. Pet food grew, grew three times as much. Um, yep as human food. And so, yeah, it is a smaller industry, but it's growing like gangbusters and every year. every year. And when you see, when you see the trend, especially from the big companies, you know, um, like Smuckers buying up a couple of, acqu acquiring a couple of pet food companies, also Blue Buffalo being acquired for $8 billion, right? That That's a huge opportunity. It's because the big players are noticing that this is a huge economic gain that can be made in pet food. And so for those who are thinking, well, is this the right play? I would say absolutely, if you're thinking from a business perspective. But of course, there's also the environmental, the positive environmental impacts, the um, ethical side of things. And so from every angle, it's kind of a no-brainer. And so I'm really excited that we're all here. And um, yeah, the more the merrier, I would say. Yeah, and I was just thinking when you mentioned millennials, so they're driving a lot of what the next five years will look like, five, ten years will look like in the pet food category with their preferences and their choices. And generally speaking, they are more receptive to uh, 
more novel ways of feeding and nutrition and formats. And so that bodes well for this kind of discovery that we're all doing in our own right with our technologies. And, and there could be, uh, and as we get closer to introducing these things, a little bit less resistance and inertia in getting these, these products to market because of that. Yeah, like Abril was saying, this is a huge industry. It grows every year. I'm going to give you a quick example. So when I was in the music industry, at the peak of the music industry, or the record industry, everyone thinks, oh my God, the record industry is so huge, just booming. It was. It, it, it no longer is. But at the time when I uh, had a hobby of putting out the first vegan nutritional bar for dogs in the late 90s, the music business, the record business, it peaked. It was uh, at 21 billion dollars. That seems like nothing. Today, the pet food business is at 30 billion, but back then, just a few, like a decade ago, the pet food business was a barely five, six billion. So they switched places. My point is, they've switched places. The music industry, the record industry, not music industry, that's different. So the record industry has collapsed. It's about, uh, you know, a uh, few pennies here and there from streaming now. No one's really buying music, but the pet food business is booming. So back then, everyone wanted to be in a band, be a rock star. Now, this is a huge, booming industry. But the opportunities are not just financial, like we were talking about. They are ethical. And I think one of the big opportunities, if you're getting into this business, is looking at seafood. Um, globally, fish account for the mass majority of Earth's animal slaughter. Farm fish are the largest class of farmed animals, and fish account for approximately four of every 10 pounds of animal products consumed. 90% of global fish stocks are fully fish. So oceans of opportunity, I'll steal that from the good food panel. But the truth is, when I went to Super Zoo this year, just incredible, everything was salmon. I mean, every dog food was had a salmon line. So this is an opportunity to figure out how we can create alternative proteins with seafood and fish to, because cats <laughs> are eating a t ton of fish and the dangers are their bodies can't handle the mercury, the toxins, the way even humans can. So there's a huge opportunity to figure out how to create an alternative seafood, alternative, not just uh, alternative fish, but to save the oceans. There's a big opportunity there. That's what I will say there. And we are completely running out of time, so we have to take um, questions right now. So uh, I think there's microphones out there, right? Okay. Or I'll use this so you okay. can pass that one okay. along. Very good. So questions from anyone out there? Uh, thank you for that. That was a great presentation from all of you. Um, so just a real simple one. Uh, it would appear that on the cell cultured side uh, that the regulatory barriers would be much lower than the for the human side. So it's, you know, from a, I know there's scalability challenges, but surely cultured meat would, you could almost bring that on the market immediately for pet, pets. Uh, is that, is that, I, I, I'm showing my ignorance there. Oh, no, no. You know, we are hoping for our big brothers and sisters in the human <laughs> food market to get that FDA approved because we have to eventually go through another process called AFCO, which, you know... It's a, it's a maze. It's a maze. So it's actually not easier to get... Treats, though. Treats are possibly easier. You would know, Abra. Yeah, so, so like Philip said, we still required FDA approval of any new ingredient, anything that gets done. Um, FDA also oversees pet food. Um, the hurdle with pet food is that you don't just stop there. There is this um, industry group that creates all of these guidelines and approves ingredients. Um, and then you have to go through a state-by-state -state approval process. And so it's not just at the federal level. Every state has to approve your final product. And if they have any issues with it, they can just decline you a product registration. And that means that you're not allowed to sell product in that state. And so that, that's a question that I've gotten a lot of times. It's like, oh, it must be easier to get something passed in pet food industry. But I think people don't, don't realize that you don't have to register a human food product, but a pet food product has to be registered and has to be done in every state. So it's a little bit complicated. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're working through all those hurdles. Yeah, just, just for context on that, I think uh, 
Texas has very specific language that you have to have on a tree product that no other state does. Washington has something else. So, so, so you have to kind of merge all that when you're looking at labeling of even uh, your pack as it exists today to make sure it satisfies each state requirement. Uh, for us, I, I think that's why we chose our technology path that we did. Uh, there's a lot that's known about microbial fermentation. It's already used to produce a number of different industrial enzymes and proteins already. So the FDA and AFCO actually know quite a bit about the basic uh, mechanics of how this works. Um, the challenge for any of us that's working on any new recombinant material or uh, a different type of ingredient that perhaps doesn't exist in its pure form today is that we just need to make sure that we collect all the performance analytics and safety analytics that satisfy their needs. But I guess in, in that sense, with fermentation, it's a little less burdensome than cell culture in, in, in that kind of approach. Yeah, and I just want just quickly to add on a more general uh, level, add some bluster to this. There are 30, how many cell, co cell meat companies are there, 35? 30. So 30, 30 people working on this, so it's coming. We're, we're, FDA has to deal with it somehow, so uh, they can't stop us. Yeah, the approval path, the, the, the regulatory pathway is difficult. It's kind of confusing. I mean, AFCO makes it difficult to get certain things approved. They have crazy uh, numbers that don't reflect all the, the, the actual nutritional requirements for dogs and cats. Um, they're state by state. It's industry. So it is it is difficult. However, it will it will happen. It's inevitable. But the approval process from dogs and cats can be easy. Imagine we're going to be able to feed dogs and cats raw meat without worrying about the bacteria, without worrying about the, 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 the dangers of pathogens that are from slaughtered animals. And the other approval process, pet parents in the future walking into a store, especially the, ki the little kids today, when they're older and they're, and they're walking into a store, they have a choice between feeding their dog and cat something from a slaughtered animal that had, that had a miserable life or the opportunity to see this ethically pure uh, bacteria-free uh, food. I think that approval process will be quite easy. So, another question? Yeah. So, so minutes. I have a question for Abriel. For your fungal fermentation, um, how, how, uh, have you pushed the mar your product to the market yet? How is the palatability? You know, does the dog or ca does the dog or cat like that kind of food? Yeah, so we have, we use Aspergillus oryza, which is a filamentous fungi. We use that in our line of treats. So that's, it. that's been in market since October of last year. And then we recently launched um, our dog food that has unicellular yeast in it. Um, I mean, dogs love it. Um, like Joshua said, so um, a lot of these fungal proteins or uh, fungal organisms have a very umami, a, a really rich umami flavor to them. And it turns out that dogs love that flavor. Have you measured the microtoxins, you know, like aflatoxin or vomitoxin, that kind of stuff? We have measured all of those. And um, for example, in Aspergillus oryza, they are naturally low in aflatoxins. They actually don't produce any of them. Um, when you think of the origins of koji, they've been bred throughout millennia, right? So the first use of Aspergillus oryza that we have found was nine thousand years ago in China. And so throughout the millennia, um, humans have been able to select for the non-toxic strains. And so what we have right now in food is koji or aspergillus oryza that actually does not uh, produce any of these mycotoxins. And similar with yeast, you know, we've had yeast with us and used it in food for a long time. So throughout the, throughout the years and millennia and centuries, we've been able to just screen out all of these strains that actually produce um, these toxins. So we've measured, we've measured multiple times. We've never been able to find in any of our batches. Thank you. We have a minute left. Alex. I just have a quick question. Do you think that some of these um, companies that are currently making cultured meat or plan to make cultured meat for human grade food, uh, do you think that their product will eventually go to pet food? Well, I don't want to offend anyone, 
but <laughs> um, you know, I would imagine that the opportunity is going to be huge, right? I mean, yeah, I do. I think that some human companies making cultured meat right now for human are are going to be enticed by the the dollar signs and also the impact, the the ethical impact as well. A lot of the uh, meat companies, the cultured meat companies, started by people that care about animals. So I think they're going to see this opportunity. Uh, this is a huge, like we said, it's a huge market. Um, one of the things I'm hoping happens, and I know we have to wrap it up, but one of the things I'm hoping happens, did you guys want to answer that question? Do you think any of the... Yeah, I want to offend anyone too. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what's going on behind the curtain at <laughs> a lot of those companies and, and like what their business uh, roadmaps look like. Um, for me, I have a hard time seeing on the cultured side some of those companies pivoting into pet just because it's a little bit less lucrative compared to perhaps what they're working on right now. On the other hand... will change though. That's going to change. That will change over time, sure. Um, Maybe on the microbial fermentation side, the companies like Clara and Perfect Day, you know, that would make more sense because fermentation just makes more sense from a unit economic standpoint to scale that up. But they, uh, you know, they, they've already like, made some significant headway and with their uh, material and their science and they're trying to nail that human food experience. So I don't necessarily think near term that's going to be something, who knows, but that they'll, they'll pivot to. Okay, so just a quick, we didn't get to all the, the, the big picture stuff I wanted to talk to, let alone the, but I just want to say, so we know these products are coming. We know they're going to be developed. I think the really important thing for all of us and anyone that cares about this space is to ensure that they get adopted. Like, you know, we brought up the FDA. The FDA just released this really irresponsible report linking heart disease uh, in dogs to legumes which is completely untrue. The, the longest living dog that I know of is Bramble. She ate lentils and rice her whole life. Um, she was basically plant-based. So the FDA just put out this report that was completely unscientific that linked uh, legumes, I'm sure, and it was damaging. So these type of things, like it, it was damaging to the, the, you know, the, the current dog food uh, companies that are using plant-based materials. So this could happen. So I think we have to figure out ways that that um, we ensure that this doesn't happen the same way that the stuff with the GMOs happened, um, that we ensure that this doesn't happen with this new technology, creating animal-free foods. Uh, people don't get freaked out, scared. And so I think if we all work together and realize that that is a really important um, aspect is the transparency and the trust. Now we start working on that, we'll have a much better opportunity to make this all a reality. So. Anything else?